My father was a very hardworking man. He um, learned to work hard when he was when he was young, and uh, in fact, he worked so hard from the few stories I've heard him tell that he can remember one time when he was young, when his father actually played with him. And so, when he um, was old enough to be my father, he had very little to fall back on. He had very little skill, you might say, or or ability to to just play with his kids. And every little girl wants to know that she's daddy's girl and she wants to hear that she's beautiful and, and she wants to be held in her dad's arms and told wonderful things and my dad just wasn't that kind of man. I didn't have the physical touch, I didn't have the affirming words. Well, my dad, uh, he struggled with alcoholism. He, he came from a home himself where his, his mother and his father uh, split up at an early age and, and that was devastating for him. I had no memory of my father at all. I was totally blocked out for whatever reason. It must have been too painful in my whole family life. My father's image is like an empty picture frame. It, there's nothing in it. I don't know, I can't imagine what he looked like except from uh, old photos, but I don't have a live picture of him. My parents are both um, raised in families that, well, my father's father died before he was born, and my mom's family was a difficult situation as well. It was um, 11 children very quickly. My grandmother, I don't think, was a very happy woman because of that. It was a difficult life. It was a very hard life. They grew up in the Depression, and so just survival was what mattered. And um, so they came into parenting probably not terribly well equipped. I believe he really um, understood that what he was doing was the right thing by providing and by being consistently uh, bringing home bring home what was needed to pay the to pay the bills and so on he, he saw that as being his primary function in our family and he really saw his relationships as being secondary my mom was a really fearful person she was afraid of, of people but I never felt any affection and warmth she couldn't give me what she didn't have but it was a very extra lonely time because the girl gets her um, ideas about femininity and, and warmth and tenderness from her mother and I didn't get any of that from her. My father got very ill and he died of cancer. And out of all that, all I remember as a seven-year-old little girl is that my life came crashing down. I had such a grief come into my life, such a darkness. My mother on the day of the funeral, she put an arm around me and she looked at me and she said, almost like she pronounced a very bad prophecy over me. You and I will always be alone. And just remember that you will always be alone. From now on, we'll have to fend for ourselves and you'll have to fend for yourself. And I felt like, like the spirit of independence came into me. I don't need anyone. I have to be strong. I have to make it on my own. No matter how, I just, I have to be strong. I was a surprise for my parents. Um, and uh, I, I felt that growing up. Not, not so much that I wasn't wanted, um, more a sense of that I should never have existed. Um, not that my parents out and out rejected me in any way. I think it was more a spiritual thing that I carried that was unintentional on anybody's part. But I knew that I was a surprise. I knew that all my life. I don't remember not knowing that. And so I grew up feeling very much like I really, I really shouldn't have even existed. And I don't think I even realized that I felt that way until I was an adult. I realized that um, I was always trying to make sure that I didn't rock anybody's boat or I didn't make anybody uncomfortable and, and so I wouldn't want to like push myself on them in any way because, you know, I, 
I shouldn't be here in the first place. Being the fourth child until the fifth child came along, being the fourth child was great because I was a baby and you know my parents took care of me and my brothers and sisters but when the fifth child came along I felt displaced and because there was a seven year gap between my younger sister and I I felt that I didn't belong, I had feelings of not belonging because they were concerned with taking care of the baby and my sister was very very ill baby as well but you know when you're seven years old, eight years old you don't see it like that it's um, a form of rejection. My father was uh, uh, into judo and that's a martial arts sport and he was quite good at it and he got hurt in a, in a demonstration where he couldn't uh, be in the sport any longer so I just remember when I was seven years of age and my, my brother was ten that we got into judo and it was kinda like we were living my dad's dream for him and we trained for an hour to two hours every night seven days a week and we were tournament fighters and so I can remember that we would go into these tournaments and we would fight and I can remember looking at an opponent and bowing and ready to fight and every fight was not about really the love of the sport but it was more about the love of my dad. I felt that every time I, I lost a fight I felt that I was letting him down. And there's times I would cry as a little boy and, and you might think that I was a poor sport but it wasn't. I, I just was my heart was really broken that I would have let my dad down and that he would have wanted me to win. As I was moving into my teen years, as I was getting close to my, my 16th birthday, um, I was feeling closer to my mom than I had in a long time and it was really quite a shock to me one day when I um, came home and uh, there on my sister's bed was a note saying that my mother was leaving, that she was leaving with, a, with another man, with a family friend. Suddenly in one, in one afternoon, my uh, my whole life was torn torn apart. It really took me years to get to get through that, to get to a place where I could even think in terms of of talking to my mother, before I could really think in terms of um, trying to process some of what uh, that event had meant in my life. It came to a point where I took most of the meaning in my life from the sports that I that I played and the teams that I played on and the awards that I won and the championship teams that I was on. For me that was a place, a proving ground. Um, being smaller than, than many of the other competitors I saw an opportunity there to prove myself and and to receive the accolades from other people and to win, to win awards was a way of uh, feeling that I was worthwhile, feeling that I had accomplished something. Every little girl needs a father. Every little girl wants to stand before her daddy and say, look, accept me. If, no, if the whole world reject me, rejects me, tell me that I'm pretty. Tell me that I'm smart. Tell me that I can twirl before you and be silly and, you know, that it's a safe place to go. If nobody else likes me, kids make fun of me. My daddy is there for me. He's strong. He'll protect me, so I crave protection terribly, and I, I looked in boyfriends for that. I had a lot of boyfriends, and I used them for affection. And of course, if they wanted to go any further into a healthy relationship, then you know I would cut them off, so I throw them away because I needed these, you know, the, the affection from from a male. I had this fantasy that maybe, you know, I'll find him somewhere. I'll find him in these guys, I find him in this dentist, or I find him in a counselor, male counselor that I could go to and maybe he'll be kind to me. And of course my whole life kind of lent itself to sexual abuse later on because I was a target, a primary target to men that, you know, that had other ideas, not what I wanted. When everybody found out, my family, my aunts and uncles, my brothers and sisters found out that I was getting paid to have my photographs taken, they thought it was the greatest thing on earth. And then of course I thought it was the greatest thing on earth because everybody else thought it was the greatest thing and I was getting money for it. Um, but then I thought that's how I was going to be accepted. So the only way to be accepted now was to live up to that expectation that I have to make a lot of money, I have to be on national magazine covers and on commercials. And that led to um, like eating disorders, I had to control my weight. Um, I was probably even two sizes smaller than I am now. And I had to lose 15 pounds and you know I took 
drugs to um, stop myself from eating and to curb my appetite. When my friends or my husband would show me a picture of a magazine or a photograph and say, I want you to be like that. I felt that I had to be exactly like that. I had to look like that person, so I would have to almost take on the identity, the persona of that person to be something because I was not good enough to just be myself. Largely out of the, the fear of being abandoned and also the feeling of not, I shouldn't really ever have existed, um, I grew up searching for something permanent that I could hang on to and I really went, um, looked for that in relationships. As I grew older, um, the things that I had used to kind of uh, make myself feel secure, one by one, they kind of disappeared on me. I started to have really serious problems with depression and anxiety attacks. I'd have huge anxiety attacks that would last for a very long time. For my dad, for most of my childhood life and even into my adult life, I just wanted to please him. And the way I thought that I would please him would be through performance. And that if I could achieve enough, that somehow I would gain that love and acceptance. But unfortunately, it just seemed that no matter what I did, and it, it certainly wasn't more, it was more about me than it was my father, but no matter what I did, it just didn't seem like it was enough. It was like just one more achievement, just one more thing. And so I became very, very driven. And, um, you know, I was, we call a type A personality and we had a measure of success at the things I did. But the motivation for that success was just a need for love and an affirmation from my dad. After we'd been married for about four years, um, much to our surprise, I became pregnant with our first child and that wasn't exactly the timing we had in mind. I, in fact, wasn't even sure I ever wanted to have children. When I was about six or seven months pregnant, I remember really clearly uh, standing in our little bathroom in our first house, looking out the window. It was, it was probably February, March, and I was looking out at the winter sky and at the stars and just kind of asking God, like, oh, what, have you, what am I going to do? Like, how am I going to do this? And um, I felt, and this was a time in my life where I didn't really think that God spoke to you like that very much, but I really uh, felt that God had said to me, you were not a mistake, Ruth. Your parents maybe didn't plan you, but I planned you. I chose for you to be born. You were never a mistake. You were always uh, in my good intentions. And um, I realized at that moment that that meant that the baby that I was carrying wasn't a mistake either. And that God, just like he had planned me, had planned this child. And I looked up every scripture in the Bible that had the word love in it, every scripture that had love. And then I marked it with a pink sticky note and I read every single one and I just felt this is what I'm looking for like I read it and thought like especially 1 Corinthians 13 I thought this is it this this is the love that I've been looking for my whole life this is the way that I want to be loved God showed me that he loved me and that he wanted something better for me that he had something better in mind for me and that I didn't have to go through my life uh, struggling with the abandonment that I had felt as a, as a, as a boy, that there, there was something better in my future and that he wanted to heal that, that he wanted to take the heart that had been so damaged and he wanted to heal it and he wanted to make it right and he wanted to, make, to, make, to give me a good life. I went to a, a men's retreat in North Bay, Ontario where the focus was on uh, knowing God as Father. The last evening's meeting I was asked to get up to, sh to share about my relationship with my earthly dad. And I, at that point I had thought that I had dealt with every issue possible with my own father, prayed every prayer, forgave my dad for everything possible. All of a sudden I felt that I was this little boy and I, I was starting to experience all the pain and all the disappointment that I had as a little child just wanting to be loved. And at that point I realized that I am an orphan and that I am a son to nobody and I need a dad. And the speaker, Jack Winter, asked if he could put his arms around me and that he prayed that his arms would become the arms of God and that God would come and meet me as a father. And I began to sob like a little boy, just needing a dad. And it was during that time that God came and he met me. He absolutely revealed to me 
he wanted to be my dad in, in an intimate way. I didn't really know who Billy Graham was, <laughs> but we were just drawn to go to this thing. We never even discussed it, we just went, sat up in the bleachers, and he called us to ask Jesus Christ to come into our life to make a difference. And I thought, I don't even know what that means. Well, he we went anyways. <laughs> And we stood in front of him, pouring rain, and I just felt like I was all alone, nobody else there. And I just, suddenly, I knew, I just knew what sin was. Something went off inside of me that, that I needed forgiveness. And I, I couldn't buy it, I, I couldn't earn it, but it was being offered to me. And as he had us repeat with him this prayer that's very simple, that said, God, I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Jesus, forgive me and thank you for dying for me on the cross, that I can live and have eternal life. I repeated that, and something happened. It's like, it's like a bridge was built in front of me. It was no longer this gap, and suddenly I could walk across this bridge and go to God. <laughs> and I could actually, I could actually know that there is God. <laughs> it was so foreign to me. Now it was personal. I am your father, and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus, my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father. And will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? When you know you're loved by God, you know you won't be abandoned. You know that your position is secure and that it can't be taken away from you by any, uh, anything that happens in your life, by any difficulty, by any hurtful thing that someone might do to you. I am my father's daughter. I am approved by Almighty God who is my father, so the whole world can reject me can taunt me, disapprove of me. Whatever comes, I always go back to Him because it's unconditional, it's never ending. God is my security. God is my permanence. That is the only place where I can trust completely because He's promised that He's never going to leave me and He's told me that He's always the same. He's the same yesterday, He's the same today, He'll be the same tomorrow, and I can rest in that. I've been on a search for home. You know, where will I be safe? Where will I be secure? Where can I relax? Where will my family be? Where will I just be able to be myself? The truth is, it's right now I am home because I'm a child of God. He's not a God to be appeased. He's my dad. He's, he has my best interests at heart. He's with me all the time. He's for me. He's not against me. And he's with me. I feel his presence. I, I actually feel loved. I actually feel affirmed. I actually feel a, a, approved so that I don't have to go anywhere else to gain those, those things that I so desired when I was growing up. How do you explain feeling the presence of God to somebody that doesn't know? It's, it's just you know.
that there's just something inside of you the Spirit of God is inside of you you feel loved you you know that feeling that you could never fill that is like no matter what happened no matter how much you're striving and what people are saying to you and you still have that you know you have a void and people know when you say this there that you have a void they know what you're saying that there's an unfulfilled part that part was filled I grew up believing that I had to prove myself in one way or another and when I look at my relationship with God and the love that he has for me I don't have to prove myself to him I'm just his son Dear Father, I come to you with a childlike heart, as someone who desperately needs to be loved. I have looked for love all my life. I have searched for love in many places. But now I realize what I've been looking for can only be found in you. It is your love that calls me to life and affirms the deepest part of my being. I believe that you sent your only son, Jesus Christ, to show me what you really are like and to bring me back home into your heart. I received the free gift of Jesus' life from my life and I place my faith and trust in him alone. I know there is nothing that I could ever do to make you love me more than you do right now. So let today be the beginning of my new journey as your child and as a member of your family. Thank you, Dad, for loving me with an everlasting love. It is good to be home. And it's good to be home. It is good to be home. It is good to be home. <laughs> it is so good to be home. The words you are about to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter. My child, you may not know me, but I know everything about you. I know when you sit down and when you rise up. I am familiar with all your ways. Even the very hairs on your head are numbered, for you were made in my image. In me you live and move and have your being. For you were my offspring. I knew you even before you were conceived. I chose you when I planned creation. You were not a mistake. For all your days are written in my book. I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. 
I offer you more than your earthly father ever could. For I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand. For I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope. Because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore. And I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. For you are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. For I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are broken hearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my Son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I loved that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. Nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father, and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you.